How about now? Is the audio back? Uh, can you hear me now? Any better? No sound, no sound. And I don't know how long this is delayed. Do you have the sound now? Awesome. Okay, cool. We are live. Sorry for that. And yes, that's exactly the reason why I wanted to start a few minutes late. Um, and uh, give me a second. I'm just trying to get set up because I haven't done a live stream in a pretty long time. And when you try it the first time, it's actually quite confusing because I was trying to figure out who was in the chat. I was trying to send messages and get this set up and then obviously my missed the microphone settings. But I think I'm online now. Um, actually, let me just make sure I can actually see the whole chat window because right now this is a bit too small for me. I can hardly see what's going on just so that I can see all of your questions and everything else coming through. There you go, I think. Okay, 3 a.m. No, here it's, here it's 5 p.m. Um, I'm hearing a bit of an echo. I hope that's just me. Um, there will be a little bit of a lag, obviously, due to my internet speed, although that should be a little bit better than it was last time. But there's likely going to be a couple of seconds of delay, I would imagine. Um, I'm hoping it's not too bad. Uh, da -da -da. So, yes, anyways, f first off, welcome. Um, I haven't done a live stream in a very long time. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I know it's crazy times for a lot of people. I'm seeing a lot of names that I recognize on my YouTube channel and on the chat. Obviously, I don't know whether I can say hi to everyone in person. Anson, I can see you in there. Nick Productions, um, Fables and Fashion, Benny TV. Um, let me know where are you tuning in from. I can see people posting different times. There's some people from Argentina in there. Um, Switzerland, that's pretty cool as well. Um, yeah, just let me know where you, from Mars. Yeah, um, probably not, but good try. Um, yes, network problems in Australia. I know that pretty well. I was struggling. I had my internet drop out just before I actually started this live stream, just for a few minutes, and it kind of freaked me out a little bit because I'm concerned that this might happen during the live stream. Um, so let me just scroll down. There's so many messages going through now. It's a bit challenging. Okay, so let me try to figure out what the questions are coming through. I'm just trying to organize a few of these questions here. From India, lots of people from India tuning in. I think it's actually quite early in the morning in India. I've had a few people on my Facebook channel say it's actually quite late. Um, Norway and Sweden. Um, yeah, hi, hi everyone. If you're just tuning in, um, I've started a few minutes early. It should just be 5 o'clock or 5 p.m. now here in Melbourne. Hopefully you're all excited. And obviously I'm still trying to figure everything out and I am keep looking over to the other side because that's where I've got my chat window. Obviously let people know on Facebook and everywhere else as well that I have gone live. So give me one second and I'm seeing a few questions come through. I'll answer those in just a minute. Uh, let me just one second here. Um, da -da -da. Sorry, I'm just letting people know that the live stream has actually started. Da -da -da. And I make a lot of random sounds when I'm just doing things, so you may have to get used to that. But. I imagine you can hear me type on the keyboard. Wyoming, USA. An Anshuman RevDep. Big shout out to you. Los Angeles, Sri Lanka. Egypt, it's 9 a.m. It's. I always find it really exciting to do these live streams. I'm always a little nervous because I don't do them, do them much. This is literally my second live stream. And it's always a little bit freaky to essentially be live online so anything I do will literally just go straight onto the internet but it is very exciting to see people tune in from all over the world it's really exciting so thank you so much for tuning in I have a whole bunch of questions already um, so let's get started with a few of them that I can already see popping up so AK asks what's easy 3d software now personally and you may have noticed me doing this. I've actually started doing a little bit of Blender tutorials just because I really like Blender. Blender is actually a really easy tool to get into, especially if you compare it to tools like 3D Studio Max, Maya, Cinema 4D, Houdini especially. Great tool, love it. But 
really complex, really hard to get into. And it's also quite tricky to make intelligent tutorials for it just because it is so complex and a very technical tool. So easy 3D software. If you're just getting started, go check out Blender. I've got some free tutorials on my channel already and there'll be more coming soon. So go get into that. Um, would you say, well, here's another one from Griffith Skyware. Would you say it's the best place to start in editing with special effects stop motion? I'm imagining that means where is the best place to start editing with special effects. Now you can actually use any video editing software to do stop motion because stop motion is it's just a sequence of images, right? So there is no, you don't need special software for that. There are some tools that I believe are a bit better at stitching together image sequences like Adobe Photoshop is actually really good. You can literally just give it an image sequence as long as those images are sequentially numbered. You can just dump them all in there and Adobe, After, uh, Adobe Photoshop will stitch them together for you into a movie so you can easily create stop motion. Premiere Pro, you can also dump a whole bunch of media files in there into a single sequence and I can't just select everything, can scale them down. It's not as easy, so quite honestly, if I was trying to do stop motion, I'd probably try Photoshop or an image tool first that can potentially turn that into a video file. Um, next thing, I'd probably try Photoshop or maybe After Effects. Not quite sure what necessarily would be the best one for that. Um, OS Guruji asks, hey sir, please start tutorials on Cinema 4D. And this is actually a topic that has come up a lot. Like I get a lot of requests for tutorials for all sorts of different pieces of software that I'm not currently doing tutorials for. Cinema 4D is a big favorite. Um, Fusion, Nuke, Houdini, I'm already making some tutorials for. Um, then there's a few other ones like 3ds Max, Maya, Cinema 4D, obviously. I'm not making active tutorials for. But the problem is I don't want to diversify too much. If I make a new tutorial for a new piece of software every week means that, you know, I'll only come back to the same software maybe once every two, three months. And people like to get a whole bunch of them in a sequence, which is why right now I'm really focusing on Adobe After Effects, Premiere Pro. There's a bit of hit film in there as well. And then Blender, because Blender, I think, is actually a really good tool for learning 3D. And I'm really excited on integrating that and showing you how to do visual effects with 3D objects in your scene. Obviously, because I've just started the Blender series, I've only got five tutorials so far. It's actually, it's going to take a little bit to get into the advanced and and but that's why I'm trying to make more frequent tutorials on Blender because otherwise if I you know now stop Blender and make one on Cinema 4D and then I make one on Fusion and then I make one on Nuke and then one on Sony Vegas, it fragments so much that it's really hard to actually get a lot of value out of the content I'm putting out. So I'm trying to do series like multiples for specific pieces of software and I'm trying to stay a bit limited at the moment, but I don't know if I ever get a whole lot more time to do these tutorials and I can pump out a whole lot more of them, you know, everything is possible. So, um, da, da, da. what are the next ones? Sorry, let me just quickly hop over onto Facebook just for a second and on Twitter, just to make sure whether I've got people asking questions there. Uh, da, da. Cool. Now, I think people have gotten it. So I think I've got most people now in the chat. Um, and <laughs> I mean, if you're on the chat, you can tell there's a lot of messages flowing through. It's actually really tricky now to really see what's going on. There's a lot of them coming through. Um, I've got Selena helping me out with this. Fables and Fashion is helping me out sift through this huge amount of questions. So thank you very much. This would be almost impossible. Um, Benny TV, do you use OBS? I am actually first time ever using OBS. My last live stream, I was actually using XSplit because when I, back in the days when I started my first live stream, I actually looked at XSplit versus OBS and OBS at that point was a bit, it was a bit clunky. I downloaded it, I tried it out, but it was all kind of really just, it didn't feel right. It just didn't feel like it was gonna hold up. So I ended up going with XSplit. I think I got like a one year license for it to try it out wasn't really worth the money because I really only ended up doing that one live stream. It worked really well at the time. It was a bit laggy though. I didn't like that XSplit kind of hooked in a lot of the hardware devices on my computer to kind of let me run the live stream. OBS is a lot more lightweight and that's what I'm using right now. It's really easy to set up all sorts of cool things like I can have, um, let me switch over very quickly. You can have, you know, embedded screens like I can show you my screen and have me embedded in the side. I can play animation, sound, video. Right now I'm recording with this microphone. I can hook in the webcam as well. So right now I'm using OBS, really like it. It's really good so far, but obviously because this is the first live stream I'm doing with OBS, I can tell you whether I really like it after I'm done with it. And once I watch the video back on YouTube, I can tell you whether it turned out great or not. 
Um, please teach motion. Okay, junior scientist, please please teach motion tracking without track points. I'm not quite sure what you mean. If you want to motion track or object track or camera track anything, you need to. Most of the time, you either need track points or something that you can track in your scene, or you may have seen it. If you watch some of the behind the scenes for um, Disney's A Beauty and the Beast, it's like a great example of that, of using motion capture, where people are wearing this black and white checkered suit. And sometimes they have, you know, like little dongles with like little colorful spheres on them or all sorts of other sorts of markers. All of those are used then by software to recreate the object, the movement of the camera, or other movement of elements in your scene digitally. If you don't have something to track, if you, I just take a camera and handhold, shoot some footage, it's all blurry and there's, there's nothing visually distinctive about it, you can't track it. So I'm not quite sure what you mean by show us tracking without track points because track points is essentially an intermediate form. You start with your footage, from that you usually throw a piece of software at it, like the 3D camera tracker in Adobe After Effects, Blender does um, camera, 3D camera tracking, so does Nuke and a few other tools, or Synthize is really popular as well, that generates track points that try to follow either the objects or the elements in your shot. And from those track points, you can then essentially calculate the 3D camera movement or the object movement. So track points is an intermediate that you kind of need for motion tracking. If you don't have track points or you don't use track points, you're likely not going to be able to actually track. Now, Theoretically, planar tracking like Mocha, um, Mocha, the software tool, the planar tracker, which I have a few tutorials on my YouTube channel as well, that doesn't actually use track points because it tracks planes, but it still it tracks visual features in your footage. And that is an essential concept that is required for any sort of tracking you do. And there's, there's really no way around it. Um, what are your streaming specs? Um, I'm hoping that this actually turns out all right. My streaming specs right now, I'm streaming 1080p. I didn't want to stream 4K. A, hey, my webcam is in 4K. And even though I've been upgraded on my internet here in Australia to what is called the NBN, which is a much better internet than what I had for my previous video stream, I don't think 4K is really something that I'd dare to try. Right now, I think my bitrate is 6,000 kilobits per second going up. So it's actually, it's fairly decent. I'm going to see how my internet holds up. And if suddenly everything goes black and I'm gone, you know that my internet did not hold up, but so far everything seems to be seems to be running all right. Now, um, Krushang, I, I am really sorry for all the way I'm going to pronounce all of your names, or better, mispronounce all of your names. It's actually, some of them, to you, it might read really naturally, but reading them, I know I'm just going to slaughter them. So apologize in advance. So Choose, choose Rang Rachel asks, do you create music yourself? Can you share your intro music? Now, the music I, cr I kind of created, but I use samples, usually from producerloops.com, which has a whole bunch of different samples on there. Now it's licensed music, like I purchased the samples, they're licensed to my name, which means I can't share them legally with anyone in the world. I can only use them for my own projects, but I kind of put it together myself. You can kind of layer things together and then build your own music piece. But obviously I'm starting off with samples I used to create my music from scratch, but that just takes absolutely forever. And because time is such a valuable thing, like a valuable resource to me, and I'm trying to optimize my workflow, I usually just use samples and put it all together. But if you're just getting started, just check out like the YouTube um, audio library, which has a whole bunch of free music on there. There's also a huge bunch of royalty free music that you can just purchase online from all sorts of different sites. Might sometimes cost you a little bit of money, but it's free. If you don't want to spend any money, just go YouTube Audio Library, a whole bunch of music that you can just download and use for any video project ever. Um, okay, here's a question from Harsh, Harsh Vermes, and apparently this has come up in the chat a little bit. Is it important to know about scripting in After Effects? Now, when you say scripting, I imagine you mean the expression editor. There are different types of scripting, right? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to quickly jump into Adobe After Effects just very quickly and actually show you why scripting or the expressions are actually really important. So let me jump over to my screen and do shout out immediately if either my audio is gone or you can't see my screen. So let's just jump into it. Um, here obviously Adobe After Effects, I don't have anything just yet. Let me just create a new composition. Uh, sure, let's call it comp. In here, let's create a new solid layer. 
Um, maybe I'm going to change the color on this one. I'm going to go super simple. I'm not going to do anything super fancy, but I just want to show you why expressions in After Effects are really, really useful. They're really good to know. So I'm just going to create this little, this little sphere right here. Um, what I might also do, um, just very quickly, maybe I'll, what I'll do, I'll do something a bit more fancy. So I'm just going to create a little layer. All I'm going to throw onto there is just a little bit of noise. So let's just add some turbulent noise, drag that down there. Maybe I'll set the track mat to alpha. So now I've got essentially just a sphere that gets used as a mask on top of some noise. Now, obviously in Adobe After Effects, you can technically hand animate absolutely everything, right? I can take, for example, the position of this red solid. Maybe I'll just call this circle. Quite honestly, the color didn't even matter in the end. I can obviously keyframe the position, come forward a little bit, move this off a little, forward, off a little, forward, off a little, forward, off a little, forward, off a little, just to create, you know, just a little bit of noise. And so I kind of have this, you know, kind of like jiggling around a little bit. If this animation was two minutes long, I'd be doing that for two minutes. Yes, you can do it, but this is so much easier to do with expressions. So let's set a, or let's disable the keyframes on that. Let's hold down the Alt key or Option if you're on a Mac. And in my later tutorials, you'll hear me say both because I know a lot of people are actually on Mac. Let's click onto the stopwatch icon for the position. This is going to open the expression editor. I can actually make this a little bit um, bigger. And the expressions in After Effects, it's essentially kind of a variant of JavaScript. It's not really JavaScript. Like there's quite a few things you can't do. It's kind of like Adobe's version of After Effects, if you so will. But you can do things like create functions, have variables, if conditions, loops, and all sorts of other fancy stuff in here. But what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to, just going to use a pre-made expression. I'm going to use a wiggle expression. And by the way, you don't have to remember these. It's good to remember them. And you can actually jump to the After Effects Expressions help page. And I'll, I'll show you, I'll get you the link for that in a second. But essentially, if you don't remember these, you've also got this little pop-up here on the left-hand side. You can bring this up. And this is essentially like a, a little reference library for all of the stuff um, that you can bring up. I'm not actually sure where, I think I saw the wiggle. There's wiggle. So there's the wiggle function, which takes a frequency, an amplitude, the number of octaves, and an amplitude multiplier, as well as a time. You don't have to provide them all. There's some default parameters in here, but you can just go wiggle. Maybe let's clear this out. And let's say I want this to wiggle, um, let's say, two times per second. And let's say by a value of 200. Let's click out. And so now what's going to do is the expression here is going to get evaluated at every single frame in my animation. It is automatically animating my position. I don't have to place any more keyframes. If this animation was two minutes long, my job is done. If you're still keyframing, you're probably still keyframing now, even after I've shown you how to do it with a script. Now, the other type, it's interesting or quite useful is, let's say with this turbulent noise I've got here. Right now, the noise itself is quite static. What am I do just very quickly? I'm going to lower this amplitude because it's going to drive me nuts that this circle is just bouncing all over the place. So it's just a little bit more subtle. So with this noise, obviously, it's got this evolution, right, which you can kind of animate to kind of get this organic movement of the noise. And again, you can set a keyframe at the beginning of your composition, move all the way to the end, and then just jack up this evolution. So now if you're scrubbing through, you've kind of got the circle spinning around, and in the middle you've got this animated noise. And that's great, but if now I go into my composition and say, uh, actually, maybe let's make this 30 seconds long. Cool. Let me extend those two layers as well. So now that works all great, but about halfway through your noise stops animating because on this noise layer, let's press U to reveal all the keyframes. Well, my keyframes end here. And now again, have to go in at the end and add another keyframe to control this. However, I can just do this with an expression much easier. Let's just take the stopwatch, Alt, and click onto this evolution property to add an expression. And this time I'm just going to type time star maybe 20 or something. And again, this is just an expression that gets evaluated at every single frame of your animation and automatically changes this value. And you'll see the value change here. It's marked as red because it's being driven by script, by an expression in After Effects. But can you see how much easier this is? Like This is why expressions are so powerful. And you can do some really, really fancy stuff in here. I can write whole expressions that calculate things. I can go back in time and do all sorts of stuff. Now, there are some limitations to this, but in general, scripts in Adobe After Effects, and I am assuming that you mean expressions, are super useful. They're super powerful. And quite honestly, 
quick disclaimer, I like hit film, I really love hit film. The one thing I find hit film lacks are expressions. That is literally the one thing that, oh, one of the few things where I find hit film a little limited because I don't have as much control over the layers as I would have if I had expressions. So yes, do learn them and let me get back to some other questions because there's a huge amount of more coming in and I feel I'm not getting around to answering all of them. So let me jump back to the full screen view so just get my ugly muck again. So what else do we have? Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, Cookie Motion Graphics asks, and this one is interesting um, because it does imply a few other things as well. What do you think about the future of HitFilm Pro? It may be used for movies like HitFilm. HitFilm and HitFilm Pro are quite new if you compare them to tools like After Effects, Nuke, like some of the industry standard tools. HitFilm is, I mean, it's not the youngest, but it is still quite young. Um, I think it has a lot of potential. For me, the aspect of merging visual effects and filmmaking into a single tool, essentially like taking Premiere Pro and After Effects and kind of squishing them together into a single piece of software, that I find really appealing as someone who does you know, what I do, like make film projects and add visual effects because I'm constantly moving between Premiere Pro and After Effects. I use both tools very heavily. Having one tool that does it all is really great. However, I think HitFilm Pro just has quite a bit more to go. So does HitFilm Express, which is the free version of HitFilm. But even HitFilm Pro, there's a few things that to me right now still make it feel like it's just a bit younger. It's not as mature as After Effects and Premiere Pro. Now that is not to say that After Effects and Premiere Pro are perfect. I have them crash on me quite a number of times, especially with the later releases, like I'm on CC 2018 now. It tends to freeze up every now and then. I can't load projects. HitFilm, surprisingly, hasn't actually crashed on me. So in terms of stability, great. But in terms of features, After Effects is dedicated to visual effects compositing or video compositing. It has a lot more features. It's a lot more built out. There's a huge amount of third-party plugins available because After Effects has been around for such a long time. Same with Premiere Pro. It's just been around a long time. It's very dedicated, very focused on just the editing part of the filmmaking process. And if you take the amount of features from Premiere Pro and After Effects, you combine them, that's definitely a lot more features and a lot more capabilities than HitFilm Pro has. Also, and this is I think one thing that I did notice using HitFilm Pro, HitFilm Pro doesn't seem to be quite as fast as Premiere Pro or After Effects. It doesn't seem to cache quite as intelligently. And so the workflow feels a little bit more, just a little bit slower to me because I'm a very, you know, jump all over the place kind of person. Just if it just lags a little dragging through my timeline, I get a little bit irritated. In After Effects, by the way, that is absolutely normal. But in Premiere Pro, especially because it's GPU accelerated with the Mercury playback engine that, that I think I introduced in CS5, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but it's a later thing. It's GPU accelerated. It's super fast, right? There's literally there's no delay. So I'm really liking it for that. Now to actually answer the question, in the future, it might become used in the film industry. If you go into the film industry now and say, hey, I know hit film, nobody's really gonna go, oh, that's great. I mean, the concepts, the fundamentals of film editing, of video editing and visual effects, they're applicable, right? And it's it's the same boat that Blender is kind of in. Blender is this really powerful 3D tool, just like HitFilm Pro is actually a really powerful video editing and visual effects tool, but they're so new that the whole film industry, which is established long time ago, they're already set on the tools they use. They use Nuke, 3ds Max, Maya, Cinema 4D, um, Houdini is coming in. So all of the new players in the market like Fusion, Blender, HitFilm Pro, they're having a hard time breaking into that industry because all of the pipelines are already set up. If one of those studios suddenly said, hey, we're going to use Blender and HitFilm Pro, suddenly they can't share assets with all the other studios anymore until they all switch over. So it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's something that I see tools like Blender actually being used by a lot of indie game making studios now, but also by some of the younger studios, Blender seems to be creeping in a little bit. But even though it's a great tool, and it's got huge capabilities, just like HitFilm Pro is a great tool and has huge capabilities. It's just not as common in the industry now. They're great to learn on because the concepts apply across, but as the software tool, you're probably not going to find it in many, you know, long standing big industry firms. I hope that answered the question. Uh, let me jump back to some more questions. Um, so I do get a lot of questions and here's another one. Dinesh Kumar um, is asking about Vegas Pro tutorials. Now, 
I don't actually use Vegas Pro. I, I've never used Sony Vegas Pro. I know a lot of people seem to like it and it seems to be falling into the same pool as HitFilm and HitFilm Pro. Um, it's a new-ish tool that I believe does combine both video editing and visual effects compositing, but I myself have never used Sony Vegas Pro. And so I'm just not the right person to make tutorials for it. Just like, you know, I don't know, um, I wouldn't make tutorials on how to draw. If you saw my Photoshop tutorial, I drew a cat, which, you know, looked more like a demented possum, if you're in Australia. Um, it, there are some things that I know I'm not great at. There are some skills I don't have. There are some tools I've never used. And I don't believe it's smart for me to try to make a tutorial for it. It's also one of the reasons why I've actually been quite slow doing Blender tutorials because Blender is a new tool for me. So I, I want to skill up on it first and then once I'm really familiar and very comfortable, then I can make tutorials. But because I haven't even ever used Sony Vegas Pro, it's unlikely that I will make tutorials at least in the nearest, nearest, near-ish future. So, um, Uh, let me just double check. Uh, where did my chat now go? Apparently John A. Furtado, hi by the way, um, tried to do a super chat. I believe I actually have super chat enabled by default. Um, and so thank you very much for trying. I don't know whether it actually worked. I, I don't know where to look to see whether it actually happened. Um, so um, I, I can't I can't quite tell. Anyways, I believe uh, John A. Furtado. Yep, it's three three fifteen on the east coast of the U.S. Uh, but I don't want to miss the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I'm kind of like a German Aussie. Hi, John. Um, it's very nice to see you on here. Um, just like a whole bunch of other people. So thank you very much and thanks for trying. Um, I don't. Yeah. I, I, I feel I need to do this more often because I have no idea where to look sometimes on these interfaces, but also because I've got my screen on one side, I've got my chat on the other side, I've got OBS Studio open, and so I'm trying to figure out um, where to look and what to do. Um, so, okay, here's another interesting question. Just give me one sec, I'm just gonna have a bit of water. <clears throat> Express Studios, what do you think about the growth of visual effects artists and their salaries in the future, and what job do you do? Now, I do get that a lot and uh, apologize to all of those who have, me heard, who have heard me answer that question before. I work in IT. I don't actually work in filmmaking and visual effects. Now, I know people who are working in visual effects and filmmaking, who have worked in filmmaking and visual effects. I kind of get a bit of a look into the industry that way. Myself, I have never worked in the industry. But I'm really interested in the topic. Like, I read a lot online. I follow a lot of, you know studios online to see what they're doing, how they're doing it, because I'm keen to figure out how can you take something that big budget studios do and apply it on like a, you know, an independent creator level, like YouTube films, short films, like how can you figure out how to do these things on a budget and simple. Now, so do take everything I say with a grain of salt. I have and I don't work in, I haven't and I don't work in the industry. From what I've heard though, and this is one of the things that does tend to happen and Maybe this is kind of a bit of a, a related story. Now, I have worked in the video games industry because I'm, I'm a developer or a software engineer and I work in IT and I have worked in the games industry. And one of the things with the games industry, at least when I started back in the days, has changed a little bit now, is that usually you get low pay and long hours. And the reason that happens is because there are so many people who want to work in that industry. There's so much competition for those jobs that they don't have to pay a lot. They don't have to be nice in terms of work-life balance. You, there, there's people who are willing to work for free just to get a chance to work in there. And visual effects is very similar because there's, there's a bit of a glamorization happening with the visual effects industry. And I get a lot of people ask me, how do I get in this work for this studio? I've seen working for this studio. Now, one of the interesting cases to look at is actually, um, ah, give me one second, I'm gonna have to look this up now. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. The studio, there it is, um, Rhythm, Rhythm and Hues Studios, which is the visual effects studio that actually created all of the visual effects for Life of Pi. If you've seen Life of Pi, it's visually absolutely stunning. It was absolutely mind-blowing. You've got a tiger in a boat on an ocean, and besides the guy in the boat, 
none of the rest exists. It's all done virtually and it looks really, really great. The movie won an Academy Award for visual effects. And I think about a month after that, the studio just went bankrupt. Like the whole studio just went bankrupt. And you're like, how does that work? And you may have seen all those little green, like people putting their avatars as just green blocks to simulate or to indicate a green screen to kind of support visual effects artists and the industry. And the thing is, the visual effects industry is actually quite cutthroat. It's quite hard for studios to get work because there are very few big movie companies that actually make movies. And there's a lot of visual effects studios bidding for that work. The problem is that once they win the work, they can't disappoint the client. They can't say, oh, yeah, nah, we need another half a year or a year because then that company will never want to work with them again. They may not get a contract next time around. And so there's this harsh bidding war going on for fixed tri or for fixed price bids for pieces of work where the client can just come back and say, hey, I, I want this different. Make this happen. You got a month. And so the studio then had to, has to push pressure on the employees to make all of those things happen. But that also means the studios often work without actually earning much money themselves and can often go bankrupt. So it is a hard industry. There are a lot of changes coming through from what I've seen and read lately, because obviously it, it's, it's gotten out, you know, like people are quite aware that it's not some. St and again, I'm just I'm, a, I'm making a blanco statement. It doesn't apply to all studios. It's very much stu studio dependent, I believe. But also I myself only have the inside from the outside in if that's still qualified as inside so do take everything i say with a grain of salt but just be aware that it may just not be as glamorous as you think so just read up on these things like talk to people who work in the industry read up on these things figure out there's reviews online the internet exists right you can talk to people online to figure out how things really look if you were to work in the industry so make yourself smart before you make a choice on where you really want to go but just for fun there's nothing wrong with playing with these tools, making video effects just for free, you know, learn about them, do freelancing work. There's lots of opportunities there, I think. But again, I've waffled on for, for long enough. Let me try to, you know, make this a little bit shorter. Um, what else do I have? Okay, Don's, Don Donston asks, what version of After Effects can I use on a four gigabyte RAM laptop? Now, you probably want to use an older version after Effects, I believe, if you look at the requirements for After Effects, I think the minimum they say is four gigabytes. Uh, let me just check this out. Um, actually, what I'll do, sorry. I, I feel like I'm always looking on the other side, but what I can do is I can actually share my screen. Let's bring up, um, ba -ba -ba -ba. let's bring up, because I feel it's, it's much easier for me to show you, right? You can actually go to After Effects System Requirements on Adobe Support. Um, you can get the URL right there. And so you can see what the requirements are. Obviously, these ones are the requirements for the latest version. So it does say eight gigabytes of RAM and 16 recommended. You can work, like you can go further down and look at some of the older versions. Um, so this is the first, first version of CEC, still eight gigabytes of RAM. You can probably run it on four gigabytes of RAM, but I have the feeling you're going to struggle because After Effects is not a lightweight program. And once you add a whole lot of layers, it, it's going to start struggling. But if you get something like CS3, CS2, you might be able to run it. Just be aware that it's going to be slow. It's not going to be like blazingly fast. It just won't. You need a lot of RAM for After Effects. Um, you can try out HitFilm Express, but I believe even that has an 8 gigabyte requirement. Um, there are some other tools out there. but. No, just, just have a look around. But yeah, so these are the official requirements. I recommend getting at least 8 gigabytes of RAM if you want to use Adobe After Effects. 16 recommended, 32 is probably, I mean, 32. You don't really need 32, but 32 is, is kind of just nice to have. So what I have, uh, here's one. Live graphics action. Why you stop Houdini tutorials? Well, um, I felt I was spreading myself a little bit too thin on one side, but I also felt that Essentially, I started using Houdini for a collaboration I did with Intel, which had like a face melting effect and I needed to be able to liquefy a 3D object. And quite honestly, I had no idea how to figure out how to do that in 3D Studio Max. And so um, I was recommended to use Houdini. I'm like, cool, there's an apprentice version that I can try out for free. So I got the apprentice version of Houdini, played around with them. I'm like, it's actually kind of cool. You can do some really interesting stuff. And so I made some tutorials for Houdini. I think I've got a beginner tutorial and I've got one on physics. Um, but I felt that because Houdini is so highly technical and so really, really in-depth, like watching some of the tutorials myself online, it, it, some of the things melt my brain. I'm really, I think 
or I'd like to think that I'm quite technical. I'm very technically minded because I work in IT and I deal with data and spreadsheets and transformations and functions and algorithms and data structures on a daily basis. I felt, well, yeah, I, I can understand it, but it's still, it's really, it, it's really difficult to understand. And the challenge now is that if I put that onto my YouTube channel and my YouTube channel is actually predominantly people who are trying to start get into the industry, who's trying to start get into visual effects. I had, if, if you're an absolute expert in a 3D tool or you're an absolute expert in After Effects, you're probably not going to come to my YouTube channel for tutorials. You might come for the silly stuff, but you're probably not going to be there to really learn because you know all that stuff already anyway. So I felt that when I did the Houdini tutorials, they were too complicated to really give an easy entry into the world of 3D, right? It's really hard to say, hey, now that Tobias is making Houdini tutorials, cool, let's, let's make a... Um, a Pokemon character in 3D animated and put it into the 3D scene. Using Houdini, that's gonna be difficult. Just because of the way the doing really advanced things in Houdini is much easier than using a traditional 3D tool. Doing really simple things in Houdini is much more difficult than using a traditional 3D tool. And so what I did at that point in my like, oh, Houdini feels like a really interesting, great tool. You can do some cool stuff with it, and I've used it for some cool effects, but it's not its not the best way for me on my channel to help people to get into 3D, I felt. It just it was too complex for that. There were a few people who really liked it, but those were the ones who were kind of already halfway there, I felt. And so that's why I kind of pivoted and said, hell, let, let's have a look at Blender. And so I started using Blender, and Blender was really easy to get started, create 3D models, you know, apply textures, materials, do rigging, do animation, do keyframing. And Blender also has physics simulations, it's got volumetric rendering, so you can do fire and explosions and other things in Blender as well. But Blender is fundamentally much simpler than Houdini, and that's why I kind of pivoted and said, okay, let, let's do this Blender thing first. And there's likely going to be quite a lot more Blender tutorials just because I actually really like using it. It's super lightweight. You don't need a license. It's absolutely free. And, you know, anything I've ever wanted to do in 3D Studio Max, I can just do in Blender. And so it was kind of a, okay, let's switch gears. Houdini tutorials, they're still on my roadmap at some point, but right now they're kind of all on the back burner and the backlog or the icebox or whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to focus on Blender first just because I find that's a much easier entryway into the world of 3D. Then once I feel everybody really knows about 3D and everything I could possibly show them in Blender, then I'll be like, okay, well, let's let's look at Houdini if you want to amp it up one more step. So, um, so da -da -da -da. Ah, here's an interesting one. Um, Shandan Shinde, which sound recording setup are you using currently? Now, I'm actually, for, most, for the most part of my life, I actually used this. Let me jump back. Um, I should have done that a little bit early so you can see my ugly mug rather than my screen. Now, for a long time, I've actually recorded my tutorials. Oh, let me just try to get this off without getting fur in my face. I've used this. This is a Zoom H5. It's actually an audio recorder, but the reason I like this one is because it's actually got an attachment at the top. I can change the capsule. I can have like a stereo microphone. Or I can have this little shotgun attachment. And the reason I like the shotgun attachment is because what it does, it actually captures sound that's directly in front of it. So it kind of cuts out a lot of the sound coming from the outside. And if you aim it at your face, it's actually going to pick up your voice very directly. And so I've used this for a long time for recording both talking to the cameras, which is where, you know, I'm sitting at my desk and you got the camera facing me um, or where I do my screen recording. So I just got this on the desk kind of sitting in my face. But I've always found this a bit distracting. So it's kind of always, it's always in, in like literally just, staring at me at the bottom of the screen. I always felt this a little bit in the way. So what I'm trying now, and I haven't put a tutorial on my channel yet that uses it. I've actually got a new microphone. I've got this one here. This one is the Blue Yeti. Um, it's actually one of the, they consider it one of the classics for YouTubers. Apparently it's really heavily used across YouTube. It's not crazy expensive. I think I paid, how much did I pay? I mean, I paid US dollars. and I think it was about 130 US dollars, but I had to have it shipped to Australia because I couldn't, get, I, I like the red, right? And I couldn't get red in Australia. So I kind of had to chip and it took a little while. Um, and then I've just got it on a little boom arm hanging here. And you're going to hear me a whole lot less if I'm not actually talking into it. And a little pop filter, pop filter is super cheap. I think it's like five bucks off eBay or something. Um, so this is a card, cardoid, 
microphone's got a few different options, but it's essentially recording sound that's kind of coming in from the side. So you can kind of talk to the side of it. It doesn't need to face, you know, in your face. Um, and so this, I kind of kind of, I kind of kind of push it down and just place it below. And so I'm, I'm essentially just looking over it. I don't even, I don't even see much of it. And it's making it a bit easier for me to now just focus on my screen recording or focus on um, what's going on here. Let me just move this over just a little bit. So I'm actually, and I'm really liking the sound. I hope the sound is good for you too. Uh, I used to use the webcam for the last, did I? Yeah, I think I either used the webcam or I used the Zoom H5 last time around. Um, and I think the audio from this one is actually really nice. One of the big challenges I've always had is echo in my room. And this one, I think is actually doing a pretty good job of just kind of capturing my face or, you know, if the neighbors are mowing the lawn. So that's kind of my current sound setup that I'm using. I also have a, a smart laugh that I sometimes use when I'm out and about. You'll see like a little clip on on my shirt. Uh, I like to use that as well. It's just easy to carry on, just plugs into my phone. So I have a few different options, but I'm still trying to figure out what actually works best and makes the process of recording tutorials and creating my content easier and faster for me. Because again, time is the main thing I want to save. And so I'm trying to figure out what makes the process better. But I hope that answered your question. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, quick drink, sorry. I'm, I feel I'm talking nonstop and there's like hardly ever a break. And it's one of those things that I'm actually trying to slow down a little bit because I feel that due to the fact that I talk very fast means my brain sometimes can't keep up with what I'm trying to say. And I introduce a lot of, um, they call it spe speech disfluency. So like ums and breaks and weirdnesses or you half, yeah, it was, you say a sentence halfway and then you kind of abort it because your brain goes, actually, that's not what I want to say. So just get a bit of water. <clears throat> so, um, Ah, that, that is, oh, John, um, John A. Furtado, um, I didn't, is saying he's now self-employed for two years. Um, that is really exciting. I'm not self-employed yet. Um, something I'd love to do at some point. Um, I obviously have a full-time job that supports me doing all this crazy stuff, but it is really exciting to hear that you're now self-employed and that, you know, like I always feel when I first started my doing my tutorials, I literally just did them for myself. I just like doing crazy stuff with After Effects, right? And then people started telling me, hey, that, that was useful. I'm like, hmm, interesting. Maybe I'll, I'll do some more. And I, I started putting more online. And I, I find it really humbling that people tell me that my tutorials are useful to them and help them in some way. Either, you know, just be excited about doing something, started a YouTube channel, you know, or getting into, you know, getting into your own business and doing freelancing work or just, you know, working for yourself. Really exciting. So really happy for you, John. Thank you very much for letting me know. That's it. It, it makes me happy. It just makes me happy to know that all the stuff I'm putting out there is actually helping people. And yeah, it, it I don't know. It just makes me smart. So thank you. Now that was appreciated. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Drag Drag Dragonoff, what camera do you use for this live stream? Um, if I read this correctly, uh, it's a it's it's a Logitech. Uh, b -b 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 let me see if I can see find the actual brand. There it is. It's a Logitech C920. It's an HD camera. It films 1080p. Um, obviously, it does look a little bit soft on the screen, at least from what I can tell. And one of the things that does help this camera be a bit sharper as well as if you have a lot of light. So I've actually got a light standing over on the left hand side. You won't be able to tell it, but you can see there's a little bit of shine on my face. So I've got a light set up just because it's getting a bit darker now in Melbourne because we had um, daylight savings um, change. So it the, C, uh, the C920 does a pretty good job of recording. Obviously, I'm not using the audio from the camera. I'm using the audio from the Blue Yeti because the webcam is very echoey. I, I didn't like the audio much, so I'm just using my usual um, screen recording setup. Um, but I hope that answered that question. Um, fizzy, fizzy note asks, hey, Tobias, can you do more camera tricks tutorials? I'd certainly be keen on it. And one of the things I've been thinking of doing is my tutorials are really long, right? I, I, I don't think people can argue with that. My tutorials are really long, They're like 30 minutes, 40 minutes on average. Takes a long time to make them, takes a long time to edit them. But I do want to start making a few shorter ones. And I, I've, I'm actually a really big fan of um, Peter McKinnon and some of the videos he makes. And he used to have a, or he, I think he's reintroduced the concept of a two minute, two, two minute Tuesday. And it's essentially just a really short package. Like here's something cool you can do with your camera. Or here's something cool you can do in Photoshop. Or here's something cool you can do in less than two minutes. Usually it took him more than two minutes, but I'm kind of considering doing something similar like a, 
I don't actually know, like a three minute Thursday, five minute Friday, or just something where I can show you something. Or, you know, I used to do quick VFX tutorials, just something quick. And I do like some of filmmaking related videos. And I do want to do more that are more less about the software and more about the technique at times. And I have a few in the pipeline where I'm more focusing on filmmaking techniques as opposed to necessarily the way you, you use the software. And I've done a few on my channel as well. Like I've done one on continuity. I've done one on L and J cuts. I've done a few that aren't necessarily related to that, but doing more camera specific or camera technique or camera tricks tutorials are definitely something pretty interesting. I'll, I will put that on my list of stuff to look into. I'd, I'd be keen to make some more of those videos as well. Um, feature VFX, softbox or LED light. Now, the interesting thing is you can actually get both. Um, one of the videos that I have on my channel is actually reviewing the Yongnuo YN600 Air, which is actually an LED light, but it has kind of like a <clears throat> a film, like it's got a, a diffusing film in front of it. So it's kind of a mix between an LED light and a softbox. Personally, I I used to have big soft boxes. The reason I didn't use them much is because A, they're, they're huge. They're like literally just, you know, they're, they're like really big. I didn't really like them too much. So I actually prefer using LED lights. And often what I do is I get an LED light. And what I might do is I might get one of those really cheap semi-transparent white umbrellas and I stick it in front of that. So you're essentially creating a soft box effect just using an LED light. Because a lot of the soft boxes that you can get, they just have the big, big chunky bulb, bulbs in them. I didn't really like them because they got really hot. They blew out quite quickly and you know they, they burn a lot of electricity and obviously they're big and bulky they're hard to store away i much prefer the led lights but i always want an led light with something in front of it like a diffuser like an umbrella or even if you don't have an umbrella just get like a piece of white cloth and just kind of hang it over the front just give it a bit of distance from the lights so you're diffusing it a bit more but i much prefer the led lights um but I want, still want the soft effect, right? You don't want an LED light so close in your face that you, you know, essentially have a second nose shadow kind of just going across like that. This, this looks ugly. <clears throat> Andy Sun. This one's an interesting one as well. How do you decide which topic to teach next? Now, I actually have, I have a list of a lot of ideas. I have, I gather a lot of requests from obviously um, you guys. So any requests I get on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, sometimes email, I tend to put them on a list of ideas of here's stuff that people have asked for. And then if there are certain ideas that kind of bubble to the top because lots and lots of people are asking for them, I start looking into them. But I also have a few trains of thoughts. There's a few things going on, right? Every now and then I do um, some collaborations as well, like with the guys of Action VFX, for example. And you've seen them a few times. They make great stock footage online. And obviously, I actually got in contact with them when they were really, really just a small company just starting out and they're just blown up now. Um, but I like working with them. And then obviously, if they approach me and say, hey, you know, we've got this new cool thing. Do you want to try it out and talk about it? I'm like, sure. You know, and so I might throw one of those in there. Other things, because I have series that I'm trying to go through right now my blender tutorial series is one of the big drivers and i've got a set of probably about 20 tutorials planned out for that blender series so if i feel like you know there's been two three weeks that i haven't done a blender tutorial i try to do like one a month so at least try throw one blender tutorial in there then i obviously also always try to do at least one after effects tutorial a month because otherwise again i, I don't want to i don't want to dilute too much away from what I like to do. Although sometimes, you know, sometimes it's a little bit random. I do tend to pick and choose, but I try to figure out what's something that I have time for, what's something that I think people would find interesting, and what is something that is either I haven't done for a little while or that's continuing on a series that I'm currently trying to do, like the Blender one. And so then I kind of base it on that. But then also, obviously, if I, you know, if I had a thousand people asking for this one visual effects tutorial, um, on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, or anywhere, and you know, in my request list that just bubbles up to the top because there's so many people asking for it, then I'll probably start doing that. But it's a bit of a pick and choose. There's no hard and fast rules around it. I just kind of go with the flow and just figure out what seems to work best at the time. But I, I, I do acknowledge that it can be a little bit erratic at times, but that's why I'm also very reliant on feedback from you guys on what you want to see more. So obviously every time you, you know, you thumbs up a video, to me that's a, hey, people enjoy this. Every time you thumbs down a video, to me that's like a, hey, people don't want to see this content. But again, it, it, it's all a balance, right? So play it by ear. Um, 
Okay, cool. I've got Hash, Hash, Verma, and John, John Furtado. I'm noticing are actually answering questions for me in the chat. Thank you so much, guys. That is really appreciated because right now I've, I, I feel I'm spending 10, 15 minutes per question and that's definitely, that is flooding by, right? It's hard for me to keep up. So thank you very much. Um, Chandon Shinde, also, thank you very much for helping out. I know there's so much going on right now. So I really appreciate all of the help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Uh, someone called Adobe CC. I have this feeling you're probably not really Adobe CC. Uh, it's probably just your username, but please do a Doctor Strange portal effect. Please, sir, I've learned a lot from you. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, I'm going to put that down as a request, just like everything else. I have actually, interestingly enough, just seen Doctor Strange. I hadn't actually seen the movie for quite a while, and I always thought it was a TV series. Even while I was watching the movie, embarrassingly, I actually thought it was a series until it just kept going. Like, this is a really long first episode. Turned out it was a full movie. It had some amazing effects and there are some that kind of trickled onto my to-do list. So again, if you want to see some of those effects, the portal effect was really cool. There's some of the, you know, the, the slings are cool, the, the mirror dimension transformation worlds. There's some really cool effects. Just have to figure out how to actually do them. Because one of the things that I do get a lot is people asking me for tutorials, but they're expecting them to be simple. And a lot of effects aren't actually simple. And so then in my brain, I have to figure out how to break this down in a way that is either, either simple but kind of looks very close to the final effect or break it down into a series of stuff but i'm trying to avoid doing series for a single effect because it, it tends to lose momentum people start stop being interested after the first episode or the first two episodes it's like ah oh, this is taking too long don't really want to see it anymore so i'm trying to do effects that also fit into this tutorial format but yes dr strange it it's definitely on my radar now that i've seen it i was pretty impressed with all of the effects so it's definitely on there um, this, this, this is an interesting question. I'm just going to have some water. <clears throat> By the way, everyone who's asking questions, thank you so much for all of the questions. Um, and thank you for, you know, having taken the time out of your day or your night or your morning or wherever you are to tune in. Here's an interesting question. Um, Bjark Istrup Pendersen kind of sounds s Swedish, Scandinavian, be my guess. And sorry if I'm getting this totally wrong. How did you come up with Walter? Now, that's actually an interesting story, and it actually happened, if you go back in history on my YouTube channel to my first green screening tutorial, it's the first time Walter ever appeared. And the reason that happened is because I was filming this green screening tutorial, but it was just me at home. I'm like, hmm, it's kind of boring if, if it's me for every single scenario. Like, mm. I, there's, there's got to be something else. So I'm like, hey, I, I have these, I have, you know these nerdy glasses and a shirt. I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, I'm, I'm just going to be this nerdy guy coming on. You know, it's like too nervous to be on camera. And that kind of turned into Walter over time. Because then the first time I did it, people were like, oh, that was really funny. I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll do that again. Just did it again. People liked it. So it kind of, it started developing into Walter. And so it kind of just, it grew very organically. It just seemed to make sense. And he's kind of like, He's kind of like the sidekick character that you do see in a lot of TV shows as well, like um, Ralph Wiggum, right? He just appears randomly, does random stuff, and then is off. He doesn't really play a big part, but he's just just a fun character to have around. And so is Walter, and so kind of that's kind of how he got introduced into the channel. And he, he's gonna be around for a little while until people get sick of them. Um, <clears throat> up, up in, okay, here's here's an interesting one. I don't know whether I can answer this, and I'm. Um, I'm going to slaughter this name. Abhinadan Madi Keshwa is asking, which software does Hollywood use to edit video? Quite honestly, I believe Premiere Pro is actually quite actively used for video editing in the industry, even for Hollywood movies. I've seen it in a lot of screenshots and a lot of behind the scenes footage. And again, it all comes from me not physically having worked in the industry. So it's kind of secondhand knowledge. Um, DaVinci Resolve is kind of a free alternative to it, but it hasn't really found footing in the industry as much, I believe. So I think it's actually still predominantly Premiere Pro. Interestingly, After Effects is actually not as heavily used in visual effects in the film industry. That's more a nuke thing, like video compositing, heavy film making, you know, Hollywood movie visual effects compositing is actually predominantly done in nuke because it's a note-based editing workflow. It's quite different from After Effects. After Effects is a little bit more, it's a little bit more lightweight. It gets used a lot for you know, business presentations, for motion graphics, for 2D animations, for a lot of the lighter weight things. Though I believe that 
In terms of 2D animations, there's other great tools as well. I believe South Park is actually entirely done in Maya. Like they literally do the entire episode and animate everything in Maya. I think that's what I've seen from the behind the scenes that they did on South Park. I'm like, it's, I, I never would have thought, but yeah, so they're actually using that in order to do the animation. But I believe in the film industry, a lot of the editing is actually done in Premiere Pro. Um, Shrimp Films is asking, I love your merch. Will you release other merch with the level stuff? Maybe you make them serious for VFX artists. Now, y you probably can't tell, but and obviously this is kind of a little bit of a plug, but a little while ago, because I, people liked Walter, I kind of ended up making, you know, like like a little bit merchandise that you can get on, on Red, Redbubble and I'm looking at a few other places to sell it on. And it's just like this this concept of, you know, like we're all starting out at, you know, like at, at level zero, like we're all starting out as noobs and so did I. Um, and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with it. It's actually a really fun journey, to be honest. And so I ended up making a little bit of merchandise, like VFX artist level zero, filmmaker level zero, drone operator level zero. And for now, I'm just going to see how that goes. And then, you know, if, if, if it picks up and people like them, I can always make them like a whole series, like, you know, level zero, like level one to level 10. And you can, you know, get different stages of skill and you can kind of show off where you're at. Right now, I'm going to wear this level zero shirt for quite a while just because I feel... I've been doing this for a really long time, but I always feel there's always more to learn. There's always new things to discover. There's always new tools coming out, new features being introduced in existing software, new softwares I haven't tried yet. Like I've just downloaded and installed DaVinci Resolve like a couple of months ago, but I haven't really had much time to play with it. Fusion, I've tried once. I really want to try that out a little bit more. I've played a little bit with Nuke, but there's, there's so much stuff. I always feel like... I don't know. I, I never feel like I deserve more than level zero, but you know, over time, hopefully... But again, it's more just if people pick it up and then people are interested, I might make more. It was more just a fun thing at the time to do. And I've just been wearing them on the show because it kind of seems to make sense, right? I'm, I'm going to wear nerdy shirts anyways. May as well be my own. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, let's have a look here. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, Aka Verma asks, I have I have a confusion when when there's a need to pre-compose the layers and why do we need to do it? Now, pre-composing in Adobe After Effects actually has two purposes. And what I'm going to do is I actually have a tutorial on, let me actually see if I can dig this up. I actually have a tutorial on pre-composing and I, I, otherwise I feel like I'm, re, I'm just answering the same question. Now it is a good question because the two reasons to, pre, to use pre-compositions is A, you can, oh, Excuse me, I swallowed the water a little bit too fast. The two reasons to use compositions and pre-composing is to A, you can create um, reusable elements because once you wrap something in a composition, you can reuse that composition anywhere. And because you're referring to the same content within that composition, you can then you know create something reusable, like reusable animations, reusable effects, and you can just package them up in a, in a composition. The other reason as well is sometimes you may have to deal with multiple layers in your composition as if they were one. Like you may have, uh, for example, uh, let me see if I can very quickly show you. Uh, I think just because I'm quite conscious of time, it's like six o'clock or almost six o'clock now. Uh, let me just see if I can actually just dig this up because I'm, I can, I think I'm rather to share this. What I might do is I'm going to share um, on the chat as well. If you haven't seen it yet, I have it to, I have a complete beginner series for Adobe After Effects. So I'm just gonna share this one. Um, so that's essentially my Adobe After Effects beginner tutorial list. It has eight parts and they have a, uh, there's a dedicated video on compositions and pre-composing and why you can or why you should do it. Um, so watch that, check that out. That should give you everything you need to get started with Adobe After Effects from start to finish of beginner level of you know level, level zero. Um, but it should be enough and it should answer that question as well. Um, <clears throat> okay, quick question. I'm, I'm going to try to answer them a bit quicker now just because time is running out. Um, can you make a short Blender animated movie? It would be really cool. Quite frankly, I have a very little artistic skill, especially in the world of 3D where I'm just trying to break into Blender. If I made a 3D movie, it would probably be two seconds long. Um, be a Minecraft creeper that awkwardly walks from the left to the right side of the screen and that would be the end of the movie because I am not a great 3D artist, I'm not an animator, I'm not a rendering expert. There are so many things that I couldn't do in that and it would turn out, ah, I mean, it could be absolutely hilarious, but it would likely be really horrendous and I wouldn't enjoy the process much. Um, 
Sat Satyam Kuma, why are you not making nuke tutorials if you are telling us nuke is the best industry standard in movies? Because my my tutorials aren't necessarily geared to tune people to like. I've never set up my YouTube channel and say, I want to help people get into the industry. I just want to get excited about filmmaking and visual effects. It doesn't have to be Nuke. Nuke is also expensive. Like there's a free student edition that you can use and a free commercial edition, which renders at a, like a lower level. But I couldn't use Nuke for my YouTube tutorials. I wouldn't be able to do that because my YouTube tutorials get ad revenue. I can't use the free version of Nuke to generate YouTube videos. I can't render out 1080. I think it's watermarked as well. Like. Nuke is very complex. It's similar to Houdini, right? It's it it's so much more complex for people to get into that. After Effects, HitFilm, Blender, they're much more accessible tools. They're much easier to get into. And most of the time, they're absolutely sufficient to create all of the cool stuff for your hobby projects to understand visual effects, compositing, and working with 3D. And so Nuke is one of the tools, again, similar to Fusion, which is kind of the free alternative to Nuke, is on my roadmap to do sometime, but it's not not right now. Right now, there's still a lot to learn in After Effects and Blender and HitFilm and other tools. So again, but if you want to work in the visual effects industry, if you're like, I really want to work in a Hollywood movie, you should probably have a look at Nuke or at least Fusion or at least a node-based compositing tool. But anyways, um, can I make gaming videos? Um, I like gaming, but I am i don't know whether people would want to watch me play and all of my time is kind of, I'm trying to spend all of my time making content for Surface Studio. So all of that is kind of going into my main channel. So yeah, maybe if, if, if you know, if, if I had all the time in the world, I probably would. But right now my focus is really just running Surface Studio and just producing more content and more tutorials. So now we are at six o'clock. Let me just see if I have a quick one, I can still answer. Um, <clears throat> just a bit of water. So I might, I might answer one or two more and I'm going to keep it fairly short because again, I just don't want to run over because I know people are up late. My voice is starting to get really tired. I, I'm going to keep drinking all of that water. Um, have you ever thought of making a feature, a feature movie? Probably not. Again, I kind of need a crew. I need money. I need time to make all of this happen right now. Most of the stuff I do simply just goes to YouTube, a lot of tutorials. I want to do some more short film projects, but that's more just hobby, you know, with the with the usual suspects like Selena, Violet and Jimmy, who usually help me out, run my little side projects and create some fun short films. Definitely do want to do a little bit more of that, but it would really just all be in my free time. I don't really have the time, the budget or the skill to really produce or work on a feature movie. So I believe that is quite a lot. Um, how Mocha works as a 3D tracker. Um, there's going to be more Mocha tutorials. There's going to be more After Effects hit film, a lot more Blender tutorials because I like using 3D. And once you understand how to integrate 3D into your shot, into your real life footage, that's going to open up a huge amount of like set extensions. You can make so many cool effects set extension. You can put artificial characters into your shot creatures. You can do a lot of really advanced things that right now are kind of blocked off. And I think that's probably one of the reasons also why I'm not really doing Houdini or Nuke or other things, because I feel the biggest value right now in terms of a wall to break through for my audience is to understand how to work with 3D and get that 3D into your footage, like to combine two, like your footage with 3D. That itself, if I can make that accessible and make tutorials on how to do that, I think I can enable a lot of people to create a lot of really, really cool effects, which is why one of my most main fo one more one of my main focuses right now is Blender, making Blender tutorials so you can understand how to work with 3D, create 3D characters, animations, and scenes. And then there's going to be a lot around tracking and camera tracking and um, object tracking if I get to that. And then how to get those two together, right? To get 3D characters into your scene or to create three uh, destruction explosion effects in 3D and integrate them into your scene because that's where I think you can create some really amazing visual effects. And that's kind of the direction that I'm trying to go in long term, but I think that's kind of the one of the key things that I'm trying to solve right now and and kind of break through that wall and create content that helps people get over that hump because it's quite a difficult hump to really get your head around. And that's kind of what I mainly want to get to. So there's obviously uh, Okay, so there's a huge amount of questions that have flown by since. We are now past six o'clock. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, yeah, like set, like set, like 
exactly, Anson. Like set 3D scene extensions and other things. Um, <clears throat> I will get around. That's kind of my goal where I do want to get um, where I want to get to in the end. And so there's a lot of things that I do still have to do. Anyways, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. My voice is just starting to break because I've been talking solid for an hour. Um, but if you enjoyed this video, let me know. Leave me some comments. Hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube, Instagram, anywhere where you can find me. Let me know. Hey, do another live stream. This worked a lot better than my last one, I think, even though I'm using OBS Studio, which I haven't used before. Um, but this actually worked pretty well. And If you did enjoy it, if you felt like you got some value out of it, let me know. I can plan another one. And then, yeah, hopefully I'll get around to answering all more questions. But if I didn't get to answer your questions, really sorry for that. And thank you all for tuning in, for asking all your questions. And leave all of those questions on YouTube and anywhere else. Facebook page is a really good place to get me as well. Leave me all of your questions. I'm going to try to answer all of them. So thank you very much. Let me see if I can figure out where we are at. So thank you very much for watching. Um, and again, yeah, just thank you for tuning in all over the world. You know, whatever crazy time zone you may be living in. It was fun. I enjoyed it. I feel I talked uh, way too much, but I hope you got something out of it. And until next time, I will see you later.